Good morning and welcome to WEP on Air. Uh, we are streaming live on Facebook, so for our global audience, welcome and please leave your questions, uh, ironically, in the comments section. Uh, this morning, uh, we're speaking with Martin Fisher. He's the head of design for Groupama Team France uh, in the America's Cup Challenge that they're about to go into this year. So, Martin, good morning and, and welcome. Good morning. Thank you for, for uh, talking with us this morning. So you are a yacht designer in a way, or a hull designer. Can you talk about that a little bit? Give us the broad strokes of what that means. Yeah, <clears throat> I've been working in yacht design for, for about uh, 20 years now. First it was just for my pleasure, and now it's, it has become a, a profession. And uh, yacht design, well, um, yacht design is, is a, a wide field. There is, uh, of course, you have to, to work on the hull shapes, on, the, on all the shapes, but also on the structure, on, on the mechanics. So there are many aspects on it. And um, in that sense, I'm not a com complete yacht designer. I'm mainly working on the shapes. So aerodynamic shapes and hydrodynamic shapes, mainly uh, appendages and hull shapes mm -hmm. for the structural part and for the well, for the engineering, for the structure, for the mechanical parts, I'm working with uh, specialists in that field. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess uh, yacht design in general also means all of the uh, nicer aspects of the boat, the seating, the, the user experience, where you're more just into sport boats that are, are raced. I, actually, I never f have designed a cruising boat. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I always have, have been working on race boats. Right. And uh, yeah, that, that fascinates me and uh, designing interiors of a boat or something like that is yeah. for me less interesting of course it's also very interesting I guess yeah. uh, but uh, my interest is really in the in the competition right. fiat racing and developing a really competitive boat right so as an undergrad you were a, a physics major uh, then you went to on to get a PhD in geophysics I believe mm -hmm. Um, talk a little bit about the early years and how that walks you down to uh, Yes, I, <coughs> I studied uh, physics in Germany and specialized in, on fluid dynamics. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, I wanted to do a PhD and uh, I went into geophysics because it's basically this, the same mathematics. So uh, I worked on numerical models to, um, to model the interaction between atmosphere and ocean. And uh, the mathematics, it's the same. So the, the equations in both cases are the Navier-Stokes equation, equations. The only thing that changes is the size of the object you're working on. So in typic typical fluid dynamics, you study the flow around a plane or, or a ship or whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And in geophysics, the flow around continents. Mm -hmm. So the, the size is different, but uh, right. the, the, the mathematics is the same. So when did you make the jump? I believe uh, you did some research, some climate research and things in yeah. Germany and Italy. Talk a little bit about that. Yes, I worked, um, my PhD was about um, a forecast model to predict uh, El Nino, that's a phenomenon in the Pacific um, that occurs every two to four years and uh, it has major impact on agriculture worldwide so it's interesting or it's important uh, to have good prediction on that and I worked on on that and then after that I did a postdoc in Italy uh, on the same subject mm -hmm. just continued on on that uh, same subject refined uh, the model and worked there for another four years and yeah, it was was a good time very it's a very interesting topic that uh, still fascinates me mm -hmm. and then how did you make the jump uh, to both the <coughs> I Beside the, the climate research, I always had been working on, on sailboats just for my pleasure because, well, I'm sailing myself. And then uh, it became more and more a professional hobby, let's say. So since 2002, I got involved in real, really professional sailing, in professional sailing uh, projects, first with the trimarans, with Franck Camas in France. Mm -hmm. So trimarans, I worked on the appendages on 60-foot trimarans, then uh, bigger trimarans, 100-footer, several on several hundred-footers that sail around the world. Yeah. And uh, then in 2011, Groupama went in, got into the Volvo Ocean Race, which is another top-level event in sailing, the second most prestigious, I would say, after the America's Cup. And um, there, the, the opportunity uh, turned up to to get into it full time, and I jumped on it, and I right. didn't regret. Right. 
So you went from hobbyist to basically the top of the sport. And actually, we have a, we have a clip here we can show of the Groupama team. Mm -hmm. So this is a, this is a two hold uh, catamaran. Yes, it's a catamaran. Uh, so two hulls uh, joined by like cross beams. And this, uh, let's see soon as you can see, it's a flying catamaran, so it's slightly different from traditional catamarans. And, and in, the, in recent years, they've actually started making full turns and full maneuvers without the hull in the water. Do I have yes. that right? That's a new phenomenon. Yes. Uh, there are two, during a race, there are two main maneuvers. One is a jibe, and the other one is a tack. And during the last America's Cup, teams already managed to do foiling jibes, and now they also managed to do foiling tacks. So if everything goes well, the hulls no longer touch the water. Well, that's a bit optimistic because you need <laughs> quite a bit of wind to do a foiling tack, but uh, actually, well, there was a foiling jibe just there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, the, the hulls hardly touch the water any longer. Which, uh, in a fluid dynamic sense, means that you have so much less surface area yes. creating drag. Yes, the uh, so wetted surface area is a main is the main source for drag, and if you reduce that, you have less drag and the boat goes faster. Uh, what are these holes, uh, in particular this Groupama boat here that we're looking at, what is this generally made of? They are made in, it's a carbon sandwich, sandwich construction, so the outer skin is carbon, then there's a sandwich ma material which is uh, aluminium honeycomb, and then on the inside, again, a carbon skin, and that makes for a very stiff and very light um, hull. Mm -hmm. So to, to give you an idea, the, the hulls there yeah. weigh less than 400 kilos. I see. Um, and, and these things are actually quite noisy. Uh, when you watch the footage, say, of the Oracle, uh, the Team USA and the, the New Zealand race, uh, you can hear them creaking and, yes. and reacting with the, they, the forces. Yeah, they're, they're very big forces on mm -hmm. these boats. Uh, they're, they're small, but the forces are never well, small, 50 meters long, but the, the forces are never, nevertheless uh, really big. And mm -hmm. at high speed, the, the foils also are humming. So quite often what you hear is the humming from the foils and from the rudders. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, the wind. The apparent wind, if you're sailing upwind, is 45 knots. So mm -hmm. that's uh, a proper storm all the time because due to the, the high boat speed, the apparent wind on, on the boat is very high and that makes for a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. Um, so, Groupama, Team France, is about 128 days out from racing. Uh, it's yeah. going to take place in Bermuda. Talk us through what had to happen to get to this point. What, when does the boat design begin? How, what's your interaction <coughs> with the team? Well, uh, at Groupama, Team France, we started quite late mm. because uh, during this America's Cup cycle, there was a change in the rules. Mm. At the beginning, the rules were or specified a 62-foot catamaran. And then in April 2015, there was a change uh, for a smaller boat and a less expensive, for a less expensive boat. And it's, it was only then that uh, Groupama Team France <coughs> decided to get into the cup because otherwise it would have been too expensive. And so we started in October 2015. And uh, since then, we have been working on the design uh, with a design team of about 30 people. Uh, full time and um, definitely not uh, eight hours a day and five days a week. It's more <laughs> 10 to 12 hours a day and six to seven uh, days a week. Then, of course, the boat builders did uh, work really hard. The sailors trained really hard during that period. <coughs> um, well, there's, there's a whole group of, of people that uh, have to, to yeah. work very closely together and it's really a big effort and it, it requires uh, long working days and long weeks to, to get the boat there in, in such a short time frame. All right. So um, give us a sense for day-to-day uh, -day type things that you do. You um, build smaller versions of this boat and then get out in the water and test it and tinker with it? <coughs> no. <coughs> Sorry. No, the, the boats are entirely designed uh, on the computer. So we have uh, full 3D models of the boat themselves. Mm -hmm. We do also all the, the simulations, the, the testing on the computer. So we use uh, computational fluid dynamics. 
um, we use finite element models for the structure. <coughs> and then all this, um, this information, or all these, the results of these models, get into a so-called VPP, that's a velocity prediction program, and uh, this kind of program allows us to compute for a given wind speed and a given wind angle the speed of the boat, and that's our main tool to compare different designs. Okay. So we, we run basically different designs in this v VPP, yeah. and uh, then we have also a race model to, to simulate really a course, and mm -hmm. then we, we can compute as a function of wind speed, uh, how much time it takes to, to do the course, and we can then pick the, the quickest boat. But that's a lengthy process, because preparing all the input data for the VPP uh, requires a big computational effort. And um, then, of course, it's an, it's an iteration, so you, you do it again and again and again to improve the design and finally pick, hopefully, the quickest. Um, so then how do you take that design the you know refined design and implement that in actually building a hull is that does that also take place in the same facility or how does that how does that no work? we we are working with um, with boat builders uh, all well, all over over the world um, our wing for instance you saw the boat doesn't have a sail it has a wing it was built in New Zealand and then parts of oh, parts of it other parts were built in in Brittany mm -hmm. in France also hulls. Uh, a first set of hulls was built in France, then the second uh, pair of hulls in, in Switzerland. So a bit, it's a bit everywhere. We were, we're working with uh, companies in Spain, so it's a, a, a bit all over the place. And um, that's also a difficulty that we work with many different companies in different locations and to organize and uh, to, to coordinate all that is, is not easy. You mentioned that it's a wing, not a sail, and in physics, in the, the world of physics, uh, many people often refer to these boats as a plane tipped on its side. Yes. Uh, as the physics is much the same about how it uh, is able to sort of pull the, the boat along. Talk about the choice between a sail and a wing. Um, <clears throat> with the wing, you can get from the same, well, there are two aspects. From the same surface, with the wing, you can, can get much more power. So in light conditions, it's important to have power. And with a wing, you can, ach you can achieve about 50% more power than, than with a sail. That's, that's enormous. Yeah. And the second aspect is at higher speed, it's no longer the power that you want to maximize because you have plenty. It's uh, you then want to minimize, or the, no, to maximize the ratio of power to drag. Yeah. And a wing is just way better than a sail in that aspect. Um, the gain, of a wing compared to, compared to a sail is about 20, 25 mm percent, -hmm. and that transforms directly into higher speed at, at higher wind speeds. So there's a significant uh, performance difference. Mm -hmm. I, I know that um, the, the sail is something in sailing lingo that is often used as an indicator of how efficiently you're heading uh, across the wind, how efficiently the sail is positioned. Do you lose some of those feedback mechanisms? Are those replaced by computers in these boats? Uh, we we have sensors, uh -huh. sensors, and but um, of course, yeah, it's <coughs> it's a bit difficult with the wing because there's no feedback. You, you don't see anything. It, the wing always looks nice, right. <laughs> whereas sail doesn't. But of course, we have telltales uh, in the wing, and then we have instruments that tell the sailors um, at what uh, what's the wind speed from which direction and then they have we prepare tables for them mm -hmm. uh, to that tell them exactly how the wing has to be adjusted as a function of of uh, wind speed boat speed and wind angle mm -hmm. so they follow that <coughs> and they have indicators that tell them um, how to adjust the wing Otherwise, it would be very difficult for them because, as you said, there's no feedback. It all, always looks nice. That's right. You don't see any slack or no, anything, right? No, no. Um, so I notice in watching the races that there is, uh, and, and I'm not a sailor, so uh, uh, please don't be offended by my ignorance, but um, essentially there's a, there's a guy driving, he's got a mic, and there are a bunch of other guys running around doing what? <laughs> 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 yes, yeah, true. There are actually four, uh, six people on the boat. Okay. There's the, the helmsman who's steering the boat mm -hmm. and adjusting the foils. Then there's the wing trimmer. He's um, trimming or adjusting the wing, and then there are four grinders. And actually, on these boats, uh, everything is hydraulic. So there's a complex hydraulic system on the boat. 
that allows to sail the boat with a push button system. So the wing trimmer and the helmsman, they have buttons and uh, by pressing them, they can adjust basically anything on the boat. But for that, you need energy. And since we are not allowed to, to use an engine, we, we use four grinders who are pumping basically oil all the time, uh, at least in, in straight line sailing. And then during the maneuvers, it changes a bit. During maneuvers, uh, doing jibes and tacks, there are many things to be done and that's too much for the two, for the wing trimmer and the helmsman to do that on their own. So in that moment the grinders uh, take a very active role and it's, it's very important so they stop grinding and uh, work on the adjustment of the foils and to, to make sure the whole maneuver um, works well. But we of course still need energy during that period and therefore we have accumulators, uh, hydraulic accumulators uh, on the boat. That's, that's basically a pressure reservoir and that allows us to run the hydraulics for about one minute, one minute and a half without grinding. Mm -hmm. But then as soon as the maneuver is finished, they have to go back to grinding. Yes. And that's physically very, very demanding. And basically after, after 20 minutes, they're really exhausted. Mm -hmm. And 20 minutes, that's, that's the time a, a race takes. Mm -hmm. And the, the systems on board are designed such that um, that the energy consumption of the system corresponds just to what the grinders can provide during 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So when you say the grinders, it's the thing that looks like a, a bicycle that's been yes. flipped upside down. Yes. And these two guys are generating potential energy that's then yes. stored and used. Yes. Very interesting. They, the four of them, they mm -hmm. can generate over, over 20 minutes about 1,200 watts, which is actually it's a small engine. It's it's not much, but um, to, to do that by grinding is pretty hard. Right. And uh, well, the systems have to be designed to, to work with that. Mm -hmm. has, uh, has the thought ever uh, been raised that you should use legs, not, not arms? Can you? Yes, we thought about that. Right. Um, but the gain using legs is not much. It's, there's a gain, definitely, but it's not much. The, problems, the problem are maneuvers. Because if you, <coughs> if you use your legs, you have to sit somehow. And when you go from one side to the other, it takes too much time to get into the position because um, the, the race course is very confined. And uh, we estimate that the longest period during which they sail in a straight line is 90 seconds. And uh, therefore, it's very important <laughs> that these transition phases are very quick. And um, with a system where you have to sit down, it's just not quick enough. But we, we tried that and we looked into that. Right. Um, so there is a, a point uh, before which you can't produce the boat. You have to wait until a certain yes. uh, time out from the race. But what you can do is, is produce a, a smaller hull or a smaller version of yes. the boat. Talk about that a little yes, bit. Yes, we, uh, we are not allowed to launch the race boat uh, before the 26th of December. And then there was still another rule change. So now it's effectively, it's the 9th of February. <clears throat> and um, but we are allowed to build a boat with uh, smaller hulls and the, the shape of the hulls is prescribed and then if we use these hulls we can for the rest we can do whatever, whatever we want so what all the teams did is they used these hulls and then they put onto, onto these slightly smaller hulls the, the wing the cross structure the foils so all the rest of the of the race boat so in the end it's a, it's the race boat the only difference is the hulls but since the boat is flying it doesn't make any difference right. because they're no longer in the water most of the time at least does that take away some of the need to be so uh, specific in, in the way that you engineer these hulls or do you still plan for the hulls to end up in the water even if they never yes yes of course of course of course <laughs> of course because <laughs> uh, crashes happen mm -hmm. and the boat has to, to survive a crash of course but uh, this time the rules are such that <coughs> the the engineering of the hulls is one design so we have to follow uh, in detail really step by step the um, uh, the plans that are provided by the race organization mm -hmm. um, in terms of the competition when getting ready for this uh, do you ever get to get out on the boat and and uh, experience the physics of the boat on the water you with mean the team? me yes 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 uh, I'm I have been on the boat not very often but from time to time I go there and um, I, I worked uh, 
quite a bit on, on the foil design. And when we, te when we test new foils, I went onto the boat, amongst others, of course, I'm not the only one, amongst other designers, just to see how they be behave on the water. And sometimes we can give indications to the sailors uh, and tell them what they have to, to look for. So yeah, occasionally from time to time I go onto the boat. And then <coughs> during training, we always have a chase boat for the design team. So we follow uh, with a chase boat. And on the chase boat, we get all the, the data from, from the boat. So at each moment, we can see, uh, we can basically see all the, the adjustments, all the, the, the relevant data on the boat. Mm -hmm. And to give you an idea, our chase boat, it's a small motor, about 8.5 meters long. It has 400 horsepower, horsepowers. And uh, if it's windy, we can't follow. The boat is quicker than, right. than the motorboat. Uh, give us a sense for how fast at top speed these boats uh, These boats can achieve more than 40 knots, which is uh, 75 kilometers an hour. Uh, to give you an, an idea, 40 knots on the water is really quick. Mm -hmm. um, um, the World Championship in water skiing is done at 30 knots. So <laughs> it's much quicker than that. Right. Um, one thing that seems counterintuitive uh, to non uh, sailing enthusiasts, uh, non-physicists, is the, the design of, of these, um, uh, the rudders, foils. Or the mm -hmm. foils, thank you. The, some of them are shaped like an L, uh, yes. and they almost seem like they dig into the water at times. Talk about the shape of those and, and the, some of the physics behind that. Mm, well, the <coughs> they, they're L-shaped because they have to, to, to provide two forces. You have to provide a vertical force to get the boat out of the water, obviously, but also a lateral force because the, the, the sail uh, pushes to, to leeward and to counteract that you need something in the water that pushes to windward, otherwise the boat would go, go sidewards. Mm -hmm. And um, so basically a sailing boat consists of two wings that work, in one in the air, one in the, in the uh, water, <coughs> and the lateral forces of these two wings work against each other. That allows the boat to, to go straight in a, in a straight line, and uh, therefore we need this uh, this this L shape because we yeah we need a side force and and a vertical force and just with the horizontal part you cannot generate the the side force mm -hmm. and also of course uh, you need something to to hold the L down there so you need a vertical strut just uh, structurally. Do you have control of that um, yes. horizontal piece? <coughs> the um, the angle of the for the yeah the angles of the foils can be adjusted with the hydraulic system that I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. So you can adjust the fore aft angle. We call that the the rake angle. Then also the the cant angle, and of course the up and down position. But uh, during racing, um, or not during the racing, during during straight line sailing. Mm -hmm. The, the helmsman adjusts permanently the rake angle to, um, to keep the boat at a certain level, at a certain flight height. Mm -hmm. So he's steering, but then also controlling yes, some of Yes, he's foils. steering, and on his steering wheel, he has ah. buttons that change the rake angle. And um, a big part of the hydraulic energy or the, of the hydraulic pressure goes into that because he has to adjust that permanently. Mm -hmm. <coughs> basically once every, every second. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's quite difficult to coordinate that because uh, steering and rake control are two different things. Right. And uh, they're, they're cup there's a coupling between healing and uh, foiling height, so it's quite difficult mm -hmm. to get used to that and it requires a lot of training. Mm -hmm. Do you get these uh, helmsmen into a simulator to, to work on we, their skills with this? We have a, we, we use a simulator, oh. <coughs> but uh, at this stage, not really to train the helmsmen. We more, we use it more for the, for design purposes. But um, I know that um, some teams have uh, proper simulators to train the teams. We haven't yet finished that, but we are working on it. Mm -hmm. And, but nevertheless, I think it's, it's really important to spend time on the water. Right. The simulator helps, for sure, right. but spending time in the water is, uh, is crucial. I'm, I'm imagining the grinders getting angry with the helmsman because he's using too much of the, yes, it's, the force. Yes, it's, it's a problem. It's definitely a problem. <laughs> um, at, for training, for instance, we, 
we, we use a, a battery pack and an engine because, as I said, the, the grinders, they're exhausted after 20 minutes. If you want to train, you cannot train the whole day with the grinders because, well, you need uh, not hundreds of grinders, but many. And therefore, for training, we use a battery pack with an electric engine. And there we measured, of course, the energy consumption. And at the beginning, it was just far too high. So uh, we had to, to work again on the design on the system, mm -hmm. but also the the helmsman had to work on the way he adjusts the, hull, uh, the, the foils mm -hmm. and we also had to adjust the shape of the foils to be sure that uh, the boat can be sailed with the limited amount of energy we have. It's fascinating. Um, well, that's, uh, th that's mostly the questions that I have. I wanted to see if we had questions from the audience or from our Facebook audience. Does it allow in, in the competition to use computerized autopilot system? No, it's not allowed. It's uh, strictly forbidden. You must, <coughs> you must not use any feedback, so every control must be um, direct manual input. That's how it, it is written in the rule. Very impressive. Um, at the speed which technology is moving, how different do you see or do you foresee the shape of the boat would be in maybe a hundred years time. Oh, that's a long period. I don't know. <laughs> if I knew, I've, we'd made it right now. <laughs> it's no, I really don't. A hundred years, I don't know. But um, to to give you an idea, <clears throat> between the last cap and this cap, um, uh, it, the last cap was already sailed with foiling boats. That was the first tour of foiling boats. And for instance, upwind last time. The boats did uh, upwind about 1 to 1.5 times wind speed when they were, were sailing upwind. Now we are doing twice wind speed upwind, and that's that happened just in, in three years. Uh, so there was a big, um, a, that was a big step forward. <coughs> uh, in 100 years, I really don't know. Um, for sure, in the next future, I think what will happen is um, that the boats are still quite open. So when they get fast, or they will get faster, so aerodynamics will become more and more uh, important. Therefore, I think uh, we will have closed boats such that the crew stays inside, also for safety uh, reasons, because it, it gets uh, dangerous with these open boats. Yeah, I was actually struck by when you see the team running about, and I was yeah. thinking about the, that must cause a certain amount of drag uh, yes. And some of the grinders have to be pretty big guys, so they're heavy. They, and, they are big. Yeah. Uh, they, they must drag on the boat. How do, how do you reduce that? Do you try to uh, get smaller grinders? Or? <laughs> <laughs> well, the idea would be, yes, a grinder this high. Small <laughs> guys who are incredibly powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist. Uh -huh. um, no, they, <clears throat> um, during sailing, during st straight line sailing, they are inside the cockpit. Um, so that's important. Um, if possible, they go down on their knees. Mm -hmm. If there's less uh, uh, energy requirement, if, if there are less energy requirements, but unfortunately, most of the time uh, we need the full power. So most of the time they have to stand up there. Uh, there's not much we can do. We work on the aerodynamics, of course, to um, to reduce the drag as much as possible. But uh, there we are also limited by the rule. We cannot do anything. So we cannot, for instance, we cannot put a full cockpit around it, which would also be very difficult for the maneuvers because, as I said before, right. they have to go very quickly, to get very quickly from one side to the other. Right. And uh, nowadays it's quite limited what we can do on that. Right. Um, with uh, six people on the boat, I, I wonder how do you make sure that you have the weight distribution fore and aft uh, correct? That, well, that has to be computed before. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the center of gravity of the boat uh, is computed and adjusted just to make it right. And then we have the main foil at the front and at the back we have the rudder, two rudders in the water with two elevators. It's like the, the tail plane on a wing, uh, on, a, on an airplane, mm -hmm. and the tail wing on an airplane. And uh, we can adjust the angle of that and that allows to control the, the fore aft trim. Without this, this elevator, it would be impossible to sail the boat. And certainly impossible to stay with the holes up out of the water. Yes, yeah. would be impossible. Very good. We have other questions? Yes, I have a question. <clears throat> um, obviously, engineering and design advantages are extremely important in getting a, a competitive advantage over your competitors. Um, once you, you know, if, if you develop a new technique or a new design, how do you protect that? Are there um, 
legal protections? Do you have patents, or do you just uh, look out for spies, or you know, what no, do you do? No, we look out for spies. <laughs> well, um, there, um, with within each team, there are very strict uh, rules on confident on confidential information. So, <clears throat> in all our contracts, it's written that we must not uh, disclose any confidential information, and we really pay attention. Um, then, of course. Once the cap is over, everything is spread because uh, the teams are reorganized or re reshaped so people switch from one team to another. Then basically everybody knows what the other team did. But within a cup cycle, all the teams pay really attention to, to keep their secrets secret. Okay. Just a follow up to this question. So, what are some examples of? Uh, different design that makes a difference, you know, that somebody did in the last cup, for example. Yeah, I can't talk about this one. <laughs> uh, in the last cup, um, well, the first big thing in the last cup was um, to make the boat flying. Um, it was Team New Zealand who were the first to make the boat flying, who realized that it can be done. Teams, teams very quickly realized that it paid to lift the boat at least partially out of the, out of the water. So they, all the teams were working on a so-called skimming mode. And then Team New Zealand pushed it to the limits and the boat came out of the water. And unfortunately, they, they didn't, for them, unfortunately, they didn't keep that secret. They were so um, thrilled by that, that at one day, one day after training, they sailed flying into Auckland Harbor. And then everybody knew, of course, <laughs> what was going on. And uh, the other teams then frantically tried to catch up, and in the end, the Americans um, succeeded. That was a big step. And another point, another important development was um, in the control systems. System the Americans worked on a um, positional feedback system for the rake control. Um, before that, all the teams had um, analog, uh, purely analog um, systems. So to adjust the rake, you push a button, and as long as you push the button, the foil moves, and when you uh, leave the button, it stops. But the, the pressure, the hydraulic pressure in the system is not constant, so depending on your pressure in the system, you had to push uh, for a certain range ch rake change uh, differently each time. And so the helmsman had all the time to look where the foil was, and that's very difficult to steer the boat and to look at the foil. Uh, to make sure it's in the right position. And the Americans, they came up with a system that worked in steps. So each time there was a feedback system and each time the Helmson pushed the button, the foil moved by half a degree. And if he wanted to change the, the, sh the, the angle by two degrees, he just pushed four times and that was it. So the on only thing he had to do was to count. There was no longer any need to look at it. And that was a major advantage. And one of the reasons why the Americans finally won the last cup. And they, keep that, they kept that secret really nicely. Mm. This time, obviously, all the teams have this kind of uh, feedback. And we'll see what, this time for sure, there will be other uh, features that will come up. But so far, I don't know which one. Very good. good. All right. Well, that's all the time that we have for today. Martin, thank you for, for speaking with us. Best of luck uh, to you and the team in, in Bermuda. And uh, enjoy the rest of your time here at WEF. Yep. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. It was a pleasure. Right. Thanks a lot.